episode 40. Let's do this. Even number. Yeah. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. I am your host, Enoch Sears. Join me on my journey past the sexy buildings and glossy design magazines as I peek behind the curtain of successful architects and explore the secret world of the business of architecture. Now, before I kick off today's show, I just want to give a shout out to two special people who left some reviews on iTunes this past week. First of all, I want to give a thanks to my buddy David Varespi, who is a landscape architect. He is the principal of Rock Spring Design Group, a landscape architecture firm in Connecticut. So thank you, David. And last but not least, my buddy Jess Stafford from Big Time Small Firm. Now, Jess left me a note here. He says he gave me four stars instead of five, and he says the only reason I give it four stars is that I hope Enoch soon makes a custom backdrop or background that matches the super energy of his personality and show. Well, thanks for the kudos on the personality in the show. Jess, feel free to suggest a backdrop for the show. I'm always open to suggestions. So without further ado, here's today's show. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch from Business of Architecture. And today I have the honor and privilege of having Brian Lewis with us today. He's the principal and practice manager of ACLA Works, a firm that does work around the world, I believe, but is based in Trinidad and Tobago, which is in the West Indies in the Caribbean. So, Brian, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Enoch. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So, tell us just tell us where um, tell us a little bit about Trinidad and Tobago because it's a smaller, it's a republic. Tell us a little bit about where you live. Yeah, it's a well, it's a it's a fairly small island, obviously. Um, it's very close to Venezuela, um, but it's, Trinidad is a very sophisticated country compared to the perception of the Caribbean. Um, it's, a, it's a quite a wealthy nation compared to the other islands. Um, it's very industrial based. Um, it's not all coconut trees and beaches, you know. It's quite, um, we, we, we supply most of the methanol for the world and we supply North America with natural gas and oil and so on. So, That'll give you a very brief introduction to the, the type of uh, place it might be. It's quite fast moving and sophisticated. Okay, so tell me about the work of ACLA Works. Where where is your work primarily located? Well, um, all right. First, I should say the firm is quite. It's been around for about sixty eight years. We've done we've done work throughout the Caribbean. Um, we tend to do most of our work here in Trinidad, but we have done work up and down the islands a bit. And that really is our perspective for the future because it's not always a good idea to have all your eggs in one basket, you know what I mean? So we, we are looking to extend our services up the islands. Yeah. Excellent. In the future. But you already have a considerable amount of work in other islands as well? Well, no, not really. We we tend to do most of our work right here um, now. You know, the islands are not um, right now are not doing so well, you know. The general financial situation in the world is it, you know, hits these small countries um, rely on tourism and bananas and things like that. You know, it hits them quite hard. You know, so they very little funds available, and usually, um, you know, tourism projects tend to go to architects that work for chains out of probably the North America. So the, those projects don't normally come to architects from the Caribbean. Uh, so I don't know if that explains it a bit, you know. Yeah, you bet it does. So tell me a little bit about your career as an architect, Brian. I'd like to know how you got kind of how you got started in architect and a little bit about your career. Yeah, career, right? It's coming to an end. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I've been at it a while, obviously. You know, um, I qualified, I think, in in 1970 or thereabouts in London. I went to the Architectural Association School of Architecture, a very good school. Uh, my tutor was Norman Foster at one time, and Rogers, Richard Rogers. The, you know, the school was very active at that time, and it was really a privilege to be there. Anyway, I, when I qualified, I returned to Trinidad. The, the history of our firm is that the firm was, the father of the firm was my father in 1945. 
So having qualified, I returned home. Uh, the firm got bigger by then. There were other principals. And um, so we, and, you know, from time to time, over the life of the practice, um, because we're in this sort of energy community here, uh, energy country, the, we are subjected to um, extreme variations in income, you know. So there are times when we call it boom time, you know, when the work for architects really is quite stressful. There's a lot of work around. And then, of course, in between those peaks, there are horrible troughs, you know. So they're, they're much more extreme than you would experience in North America and in different countries around the world. So we have to be, as it were, on our toes to expand uh, and do a lot of work in a very short time and then have nothing probably or very little work in between those peaks. So, and that's how we, so we have done some fairly large projects um, over the life of the firm and we've done some fairly tall buildings and big you know, halls of justice and financial complex and um, huge shopping centers and even a university. Uh, so, you know, we've had our share, well, we, we have done some of the largest work in, in, in Trinidad for sure, um, but it, it varies a lot, you know, that's all I would say, you know, so yeah, over the last few years it has been particularly difficult. I think things are picking up now. Um, I'm sensing, you know. Yeah. So that's a, a very brief. Uh, we, we do mostly um, kind of corporate, commercial, uh, civic buildings, uh, planning and things like that. We we try not, um, because the firm at one time was a bit larger, we were at one point uh, 35 people, most of which were architects. Um, right now we're probably down to about 10 or 12. Um, so we tend to do not do residential work too much. You know, we, we pick and choose our residential projects because, frankly, you know, it, 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 it's difficult to, um, to to make a to not make a loss. Let me put it that way. For a firm that is bigger, to do you know, it's very difficult to do residential projects and not make a, a serious loss. You know, so we we do a few and they're very very nice projects too. You know, but not we can't survive frankly, on that, you know. Yeah. What kind of things has your firm been doing to combat those cycles, to try to buff yourselves against those ups and downs? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question that, you know, when I, when I first qualified backing up a bit, like 30, 40 years ago, um, things really have changed a tremendous amount since then. In those days, there was no marketing, you know, no, no, no strategy for planning and, and anything like that. Work just kind of came, you know. But things certainly have changed over the years, and now it's much more challenging. And so gradually the plot sort of became clearer to us um, when we realized we have to do so, we have to we have to make work happen. You know? So over the years, we you know because we've been around for a while, we have tried and tested a number of um, methods. Yeah, we 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 have even brought down. Um, a U.S. trainer for architects, uh, Jack Regal, who I met, um, I think, in San Francisco at an AIA conference uh, that I attended, uh, obviously for architects, and I was quite impressed with his talks and the course that he did there. And we eventually brought him to Trinidad, and he was very helpful. We developed our own strategic um, plans that we had for the firm about, let's say, about five or six or seven years ago, I can't remember exactly, but, um, and and we continue to adjust, you know, we have to keep changing, because every year, I think, you know, the, the whole character of the marketplace, um, the, the, the sort of the types of projects, the type of clients, constantly changing, um, and you have to keep adapting your methods, you know, um, and sometimes, what I, one, one thing I would like to say is that one thing I learned by trying to find, I mean, we've read a lot as well, you know, we, we, we get books and we have some very books on marketing, but one of the things I did learn, and I have learned the painful and hard way, is that every market, when I'm speaking particularly for my own experience, has a different character. So that, so that you know, methods that work in, in Australia or in China or wherever may not work here at all. It's a different, you know, 
in, in some countries, um, the quality of your work plays a great part in getting new work. Um, I mean, I'm sure for everybody knows no one faster, for example, you know, and his work is brilliant. Yeah. But um, in other parts of the world, city here, I don't think the quality of the work plays the part that it ought to play. And it's much more, um, I, we have discovered much more to do with contacts and personal relationships than in the quality of the work, you know. So doing, doing good work, which we, we like to do as an architect, and most of us want to do that, um, it, it's not enough. It doesn't actually get you any work. I, I think it's very important to present the work that you do very well, and it's very important in this market, in our market here in the Caribbean, to establish personal contacts. I mean, people need to see you out um, in the world, as it were, out in the public. They need to see how you behave. So you have to position yourself in different places where um, your prospective clients, you know, will live. Or, you know, so maybe they are part of a club or rotary or one of these, or on the golf course or wherever it is your clients reside, as it were, your prospective clients. And you need to try and position yourself in their view so they can see you. They want to make sure, uh, you know, these people are not, are not stupid. They, they want to see how you perform as a person just you know, dealing with everyday life, you know. They're not, um, <clears throat> they're not necessarily searching the internet looking for an architect. They're much more looking for um, somebody that they can relate to, um, that they feel comfortable with, um, who has a reasonable reputation, but most of all, they can get along with. That's what I'm, I've learned. Um, because you see, I think we, we and our firm, we, we spend a lot of time branding our firm. I think doing all the, all the right professional things with, with a view to marketing the firm. I think we've done a pretty, pretty good job, if I may say so myself. But the area that we neglected a bit, um, because because it wasn't presented to us that way, is the, the sort of the need for the personal relationship angle, which is unique, I think, to our particular market, and, and would apply to many others as well, of course. But um, so I don't know if that. Um, it does, Brian. So, when, I mean, when you say when you say that it wasn't um, presented, could you give it a little bit more detail about that? About how you guys neglected that personal relationship side, or what you mean by that? Give me a little bit more information to understand. Well, I, I think, um, well, you know, the, the, the path that we were following, the books that we were following, the, the courses that we attended and so on, didn't seem to focus on that aspect until recently. I, I did attend a course recently. Um, in Montana, actually, of all places, uh, where by chance I uh, I attended a course, a course on marketing there, and I thought um, the message there really wrong for me, you know, that really it is because of the need to establish personal relationships with the people that you're trying to get work from, um, that that was something that we weren't focused on. We were focused on you know, getting a website looking good, making sure the branding was good, um, you know, and things like that. All all those elements, but we weren't looking at the people element, you know, enough. So that's what we are trying to address now. So we we have de developing a sort of client care plan, uh, in which we are looking more closely at our prospective clients that we are targeting now, and looking at how to get closer to them. What, what we need to do to get closer to them. So that's where we are now. Because I think we have got the foundation in place. Um, as I said, the branding and all of that, our, our firm is pretty solid in, in all those areas. But the one area that we need to develop is the personal relationship side of things. Sure. And what things are you doing to get closer to them? Well, uh, we're active, actually, actually actively involved in it now. You know? So um, every week we have a little meeting in the office in which we um, we have different lists, you know, I'm, I'm following um, the course that I, I attended, as I say, which seemed to make sense to me, in which we 
establish different categories of clans. First category is the clan, clans that we, we know them and they have projects now. That's category, that's our priority. The second category of my memory is prospective clans that may have projects and that we know the people. Um, and the third category is, let's say, mark, uh, leaders in, in the community that ought to be, uh, we, we ought to know better. So, and more, that's more long term, obviously, you know. So, and then for each, for each, for each of the people involved, for each of the prospective targets, you know, we sort of try and do um, a plan as specifically for that person, you know, who is going to get to them. Is it going to be a call? Is it a lunch? You know, or you know, meet at the club or whatever it is. Um, so we try and generate a, a plan for each person, very specific, specific for each person. So that's what we're doing now. But we're actually in the middle of it, you know. So I, I can't, um, you know, I can't say how it's going to turn out yet. But I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to me in our market. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think it would make sense in most markets because. Just re power of relationships. I can't. I haven't found anything more powerful than being able to establish a relationship with a person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not, they're not actually hiring a firm as such. Yeah. They're really hiring somebody they be comfortable with. You know. So. Yeah. Most of the time, anyway. Absolutely. Um, so let me see the three categories. The first one was people that you know that have projects now. The yeah. second category, I kind of missed that one, and I have the third category where leaders in the community more of a long-term outreach. Tell me which was the the second category again. Yeah, well, I'm 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 doing this on the wing, eh? Yeah, so, no problem, no problem. Uh, let me see. It, it was um, people that we know that may have projects coming up. Okay. <clears throat> or that 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 usually have projects coming up, that type of thing. Yeah. They may not have one right now, but maybe in a year's time. Or, so you know that yeah. type of, so you have to keep to keep close to them because things happen from time to time you know? yeah that yeah yeah and, and we're not we're not talking about hundreds of names and we're talking about uh, not more than let's say 10 in each group if if that you know yeah so again the first group it's quite small right now it's about maybe eight people eight eight groups you know eight people and then second it gets bigger as it goes down Category three, as it were, might have twenty-five people that we but sure, and it's, it's and it's very manageable, right? Well, I think so. I mean, it's um, the test, of course, is to is you need to develop a implementation plan that it keeps coming up every week, and that, so that we have a meeting, you know, we have to report on well, what's been done. Otherwise, it just becomes a kind of theoretical idea. Um, this this is a plan that has to be executed, not talked about you know yeah so I like that so you sort of outlined the number one the first step was planning sort of figuring out where you wanted to be and then identifying the the players or the people who'd be who you need to reach out to and developing a strategy about how to contact them and then sounds like what you're saying is the follow-up and the follow-through is important yeah the follow-up the implementation as I say otherwise it becomes just a an academic exercise yeah and people lose confidence when you don't uh, carry through those kind of plans. You know, they say, "Oh, all right, another, another waste of time." You know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you have you have to keep on top of it. You know? Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about what it takes to make a strategic plan for a firm. You know, you said you did this about four or five years ago. You brought in a business consultant. What is that process like? Well, it's it, first of all, it's I think it's very intensive. You know, you, you have to put, uh, you ought to really. It's better to bring in somebody to do it. You know, that's the first thing I should say because, you know, there, there's a lot of um, psychology going on sometimes in firms between principles and so on. Uh, you know, people are complicated, you know. So anyway, the advantage of bringing in somebody is that he can be more objective and read, he can read what's happening if he's experienced enough, you know. So I would recommend bringing in a specialist and, and particularly if you can find one that does architectural firms so much better, um, not doing just, you know, chop it too hard, but I mean, that's what he does. He, he does mainly for design firms, you know, so he was, that's why I brought him down. We have had strategic plans by, you know, 
these sort of trainers that there are many around, but we didn't find them as focused on our profession as, as, as specialists, you know. So I'd recommend a specialist. Um, and you put aside two or three days, get away from the office or in a, in a location where you're not going to be disturbed because it really takes an intense effort. Um, I, I don't think I would like to really necessarily um, recommend a particular process because I think each strategic planner would have his own. What I would say is that, uh, and we found this particularly with Jack, is that he he would ask a lot of questions before he came, you know, because he had to come to Trinidad, and you know, and and in fact, other strategic planners we dealt with also, they they ask a lot of questions first, and then they, as it were, they, they determine what are the key issues that that is um, is necessary at this time for the practice. What are the problems that need to be overcome, and then. The strategic plan would then more focus in that area rather than starting, you know, with a complete white sheet of, you know, how long have you been in practice and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you get past some of that stuff and 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 you have get a more focused um, approach to your planning. So I think I think that would be an important comment to make. But I th I think each planner would have a different approach. I mean, sure, you do a SWOT analysis and all that kind of stuff from the strategic situation analysis where you are now maybe that would be a place to start off with and usually they would ask each principal or each of the parties involved is not um, what's on their mind so they, they are allowed to as it were uh, they, they're, they are to speak about really issues that are really bothering them in particular individually so maybe nothing to do with getting work it might be that they have sort of staff issues or salary issues or you know a firm can is a very complex thing so um, unless you can get past some of those blockages um, you know thinking ahead about work it, it becomes kind of it's not authentic you know so you really have to deal with the issues that human beings have first before they can think positively about it, the communal outlook well i just came up with that on the fly huh? <laughs> I like that. But I think it's true. I think it's true. Seeing that. So, and, and then the results of this strategic plan, tell me about what you end up with. You end up with a report. I mean, what after the you go through this process of self-analysis, identifying the problems, outlining the solutions, What's how does that go? Well, yeah, um, I'm being a little vague because I don't really believe there's one approach, you see. So, but ultimately, in our case, we, we ended up with a, a very professionally and substantial um, document, very well laid out, you know, which Jack helped a lot with at that time, with the diagrams and everything in it, and um, with an action plan at the end, because all of this needs to be translated into action. So it becomes then a kind of living tool. It's not just something that you, you do once and then stick it in a cupboard or a filing cabinet. It becomes, as it were, a reminder of all the issues that the firm addressed at that time. Um, it also sets up a procedure for making constant re improvements. I, I really recommend a sort of um, a session every year, you know, if, if people can afford that, or, or even a mini session, a half day or a day, whatever the, the people involved can afford in terms of time and money. Um, not necessarily that you need to bring in somebody each time but when you're doing a major strategic plan i would recommend bringing in somebody but i think for an annual sort of review the principles assuming that there's more than one principle i think can adequately handle that uh, for, for those sole practitioners i think then it, it would be helpful to have an objective uh, performance review as it would so so I, I, unless uh, uh, unless strategic planning gets down to to action, I think it is it's really not that useful. Um, really, it, it, because strategic plans imply that changes have to be made. The market is changing; everything's changing. So the plan is going to end up with certain changes that have to be made. 
as a result of analyzing all the different aspects of the work. And that change requires effort and requires planning. Otherwise, it just becomes a notion, oh, we've got to, you've got to do something about that. And then it gets, you know, that's the end of that. <laughs> but you have to, you have to make a list of the things, as it will, that come out of these, this investment of time and effort that people have in the firm. And I think it's the challenge is for us to make those things happen because presumably those are the things that will take the firm into another level. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the changes to the profession. You said over your the span of your career, you've seen the profession has changed a lot, and you've talked about how the competitive landscape has gotten more competitive, and things don't necessarily work the way they used to. Would you talk a little bit more about your perspective, looking back on your yeah. career? Well, yeah, it's really changed a lot in the last twenty years. Really, it's unbelievable. But um, yeah, today, particularly, um, there are great numbers of architects qualifying. You know, it's so it's it's more and more architects looking at less and less work. So obviously it's going to get more and more competitive. Um, and, and um, you know, you go to school and you learn how to design. Nobody teaches you about how to make a living. At least maybe they're doing it now, but certainly in my day, um, that was never an issue. And yet it's it's really one of the central issues of, of, of surviving and doing good work today. So because it's very competitive out there, so competing is, is a competition and reducing fees even, I don't, you know, it varies at different times and so on in different countries. But, um, and then in our part of the world, particularly um, where, as I, I would describe, most architects here, generalists uh, with perhaps with some experience in different pockets. Um, so when, when a client in, Sydney and this part of the world wants to build a hospital, they don't call they don't call any of the local firms. They'll call somebody in Texas that is a specialist in hospitals. And um, unless unless that firm is abiding by the UIA or the International Union of Architects, they are they are put calls. They may come in here and just do a project, you know, and there'll be let, very little uh, ambition of specialized knowledge here. Um, so special projects and, and projects are getting more and more special I find. You know, hospitals are becoming very complex, judicial buildings, sports complexes, stadiums, all these things. I find that um, they're becoming more and more specialized and therefore clients are requesting latest thinking on by architects uh, and usually they go to um, U.S. or U.K. architects who specialize in those areas, uh, and and therefore there is a role I think for what they call executive um, executive services lo local architects who will work together with a foreign specialist. Um, but the way it's being done, it's really up to the foreign specialist to decide what local services he needs or wants. So, um, so that is an area. So whereas before principally before um, and a different time and different mindset and each country is different right? Barbados for instance <clears throat> the next island up the chain is very uh, they, they they are very selective in in, in in investors in their country they, they insist on a high local content um, and if you don't if you're not going to guarantee that then they probably won't let you there whereas in Trinidad uh, very little. There seems to be very little interest in in local content, and you know. So each, each country is quite different. You know. um, other other areas of concern is the, I mean, design build has certainly in the last um, four or five years taken foothold here in Trinidad, particularly for government projects. Um, with it has had a devastating effect here on the local industry here in, in Trinidad and. And, and also the, um, we have been subjected to the Chinese um, syndrome. Yeah, tell me, what is the Chinese syndrome? Well, they, the Chinese, of course, have a huge problem. They have a lot of labor 
um, available to them um, a lot of products and money as well so what they what they have been doing in, in the Caribbean and it's not just in Trinidad but in Trinidad is they you can't compete with them nobody can compete with them nobody they, they have the cheapest money they come here with everything they come here with little barrows thread needles food everything they don't buy anything very little they use as much of Chinese uh, input as, as they can so the, the bottom line is it, it really is not very good for, for the country yes you get a building out of it hopefully it works you know but sometimes chi Chinese things don't always work well this uh, is interesting so this is the first time I've heard of this I, I guess I've heard of it a little bit before but explain to me this process is this are they coming to build projects in Trinidad? Yeah, yeah, they're coming to finance the projects too, and that's how they <clears throat> that's how they they get a free hand um, at these projects. They, they're not they're probably uh, most of the time they're not even tendering, you know, or you know, there's no they, because they are coming with everything, including their own money. You know, it's like a gift. You know, it's almost like a so a government. Um, in a third world country, which I have to say we are, um, is, is that they're very happy, they welcome the Chinese because they're bringing the money, they're, bringing, they're getting everything done. The government has little to do to worry about in a sense. And so it's very attractive for a government that can understand. Um, however, if a government doesn't have a clear view of human development of its taxpayers, then it's really quite a short-sighted approach, um, really, because, um, you know, the construction industry in this country, Sydney, employs a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so do they, bring in, people. do they bring in their own foreign labor also? Do they, they ship over Chinese every patriots and... Fred, wheelbarrows, everything. Every single thing. That is remarkable. That is just yeah. remarkable. It's remarkable that the, the government allows them to do that. You know? Yeah. I think more recently they are starting to, I don't know if it's because of pressure or because of economics or whatever, they're starting to allow some involvement by professionals, but lim very limited so far. I don't know if it's because of pressure from the government or if it's cheap. Well, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So I guess that's why but, you say it's it's country by country because when I used to live in Panama, which of course is um, a similar latitude as you, but just across the ways yes. a little bit, you know, yeah. I know they were very they do protect their interests and it is difficult. You can't just bring in outside workers to construct projects there. They're very protective of of their own personal you know, they want you to employ the people that work there in the country. So Trinidad has a much more open door policy, it sounds. Yeah. Very, it's very. In fact, I think sometimes they, <laughs> they favor foreigners <laughs> than locals. You know, I, I won't explain why, but I think sure. anybody watching this program can figure it out. Can know? imagine. Well, I mean, it's the same thing in Panama. Sometimes, if you have more unskilled labor, there's the desire to bring in skilled labor. There could be other issues at at play there. Yeah, there are other issues. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine what they are. Trust me. <laughs> So that's that's very fast. It's a sad, sad, it's a sad development, but it, you know, I'd have to say corruption is quite a problem right now in this in this place. You know? Sure, sure. So, but you see, I mean, the government tends to be a major employer um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and 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 depending on the government's performance. At any particular time, the private sector, the private sector of activity is, as it were, a barometer of the government's performance. You know, so, so they, they work. In a sense, they they don't work together, but they they flow together, if you like. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the activity is, you know, anyway. Yeah. Enough economic theory. <laughs> yeah, some geopolitical questions there. I mean, it sounds like a it's, smart move. They're like, we'll let the U.S. spend all of their money patrolling the entire world, while we use our money to build and <laughs> do financial developments everywhere. Well, it may be. In fact, you know, I mean, don't forget in the United Nations, um, each each country has a vote. You know, and the Caribbean is a lot of little countries. You know, um, and that's why um, Jack, you know, famous. Uh, football personality at FIFA 
uh, became world famous because he, he had control of 30 or whatever odd votes from the Caribbean islands and, and he, that put him in a very powerful position. I, I think China is looking, I would expect that they're looking at it at United Nations from that point of view as well. You know? Very strategic. Yep. They, they, yeah, I think I think it's strategic and I think of course they have a huge lever, excess, one, excess money and they're looking for markets for their products and governments uh, have to be a convenient place to, you know, foreign governments, countries, uh, a convenient place to reside these um, excesses, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, well. But, um, you know, I'm not really going to worry about that too much. I mean, that's a, f a fact of life. Uh, yeah. At least at this point, you know, that's. I don't want to be too negative anyway. Well, and the, and the you know the question was, and you you answered it well, and from your perspective, how has the profession changed? And you mentioned a number of things. You said it's gotten more competitive. You mentioned that there's been more specialization required, and you're talking about outside forces that are that didn't exist before that are having to be dealt with. So it's think, it's a changing landscape. Well, Brian, do you yeah. have do you have any other thoughts on the business of architecture before we terminate this uh, interview? Well, um, that you'd like to add fact, to the conversation? Except I would say that uh, one of the markets that came out of our strategic plan is to is to position ourselves to be executive architect for foreign firms. You know? That's one of because that makes we a have lot a lot of sense. Of, um, so that's one of the areas that we responded to. Them. Yeah, you seem you seem to be well positioned to do that. Yeah, I think yeah. yeah. Good. Well, Brian, thank you for joining us on the Business of Architecture show and talking a little bit about what life is like and uh, the professional practice in Trinidad and Tobago. You're very welcome. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, Join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week... Keep rocking and go conquer the world. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.